please do join me as we go back in time to a nostalgic era of American history, the 1950s. It was a simple time for many, a time when families moved to the suburbs. A typical family may see the wife prepare breakfast for her husband and kids before they headed off to work and school, hopefully without any major mishaps. Honey, your coffee's undrinkable. It's pretty harsh. Well, so's your coffee. On paper, everyone was so happy, nothing could possibly threaten such an idyllic way of life. Well, except for the constant threat of a Soviet nuclear attack. The Soviets were not fans of the American capitalistic way of life. They hated our cookie cutter houses that all looked the same. They preferred brutalist apartment buildings that all looked the same. Understandably, Americans were pretty freaked out about an upcoming atomic annihilation. To many, it wasn't a matter of if. But when? The government was also pretty freaked out, so they put together the Civil Defense Administration. It was the Civil Defense Administration's job to keep Americans safe in the event of a Soviet nuclear strike. They were responsible for the implementation of civil defense sirens, what we call tornado sirens today. They were also responsible for CONRAD, a precursor to the emergency alert system we have now. The CDA was also curious about the effects of nuclear weaponry on buildings such as homes and warehouses. They wanted to know what would happen to the people inside of these buildings, and where the best places within those buildings would be to take shelter. So throughout the 1950s, they tested numerous atomic bombs on various civilian structures. Warehouses, bunkers, homes, bank vaults, cars. They even built a tiny town with working electricity and various home designs. In several of these tests, they used mannequins to showcase atomic bombs effects on humans. Time and time again, they constructed buildings only to just nuke them to see what happens. So what did happen? What did they learn from these experiments? What happened to the mannequins? Can we still use this data today? Like, what really are the best places to take shelter? I want to know in case, you know, something happens in the upcoming years. Also, are there any remnants of these structures today? Could you go and visit them? That is what we're talking about. Let's get into it. Now, before we get into the video and watch tons of nuclear bomb footage, let's watch this simulated nuclear bomb footage from today's video sponsor, War Thunder. War Thunder is a massive online free-to-play action military combat game where you battle via land sea, and air in many locations throughout the world. With War Thunder, you the player can immerse yourself in cinematic battles featuring amazing graphics, physics, and sound. You want to be down on the ground fighting on the front lines? You can do that. You want to be up in the clouds dodging bullets taking out enemy fighter jets? You can do that too. You want to be out on the high seas? That is also an option, all within the same map. One amazing feature of War Thunder are the many different military vehicles this game has to offer, spanning back an entire century. It's seriously crazy, the amount of vehicles in this game is ridiculous. There's even like obscure prototypes and stuff. It's sweet. And you can customize all these vehicles. War Thunder is always improving through updates. The recent Seek and Destroy update, for example, added new maps and new homing missiles. Download War Thunder today for free, for free, by using the link in the description. It's available on PC, Xbox, PlayStation, and Mac. All new players and those who haven't played War Thunder for a half a year or more will receive special bonuses. These bonuses include rentals for the P-40, E-1 aircraft, and M-4 tank for a week, a special decorator, Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, three premium vehicles for free, a week of premium account status, and even more gifts. Hurry up, the American Vehicle bonus season will end soon. Thank you so much to War Thunder for sponsoring the video. I want to start off by talking about the cities that were actually bombed with atomic weapons during World War II, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a tragic event that claimed somewhere between 150 and 250,000 lives. While surveying the damage, it was noted that while many of the buildings in the two cities were completely destroyed, several buildings close to Ground Zero were still standing. Some were even in decent condition. Clearly, some building designs were better suited for withstanding an atomic explosion. The US government was intrigued by these results and wanted to further investigate the relationship between nuclear explosions and man-made structures. This would all lead to the first nuclear bomb test on a mini town during Operation Greenhouse on April 20th, 1951. The mini town would be nuked with a 47 kiloton device during the second test of the series, Shot Easy. The test was conducted at the Pacific Proving Grounds over one of the chain islands part of Enowetak Atoll named Njibi. That is this island right here. The bomb itself was located on a tower on this exact corner of the island, 
where this little concrete pad is today. Before the test was conducted, several buildings including a steel framed warehouse, a two story brick home, as well as various bunkers and hangars were constructed as part of Program 3. Program 3 had two goals. One was to study the effect an atomic bomb would have on these structures to find ways to improve our own buildings. The other goal, which was actually more important to the researchers, was to find out the kind of damage we would do to an enemy target. Some buildings were exposed, some had open windows, some had thicker concrete, but all were built to get a better idea on structural reactions to atomic bombs. From this aerial footage, we can see that they, they really went to town. Like these are some pretty serious constructions. That's a big warehouse right there. They even had this concrete naval building that was only 50 meters away from ground zero. Like this is the tower right here where the device was located and here's the building. So yeah, that's definitely close. This particular building had a reinforced concrete roof five feet thick. So a mega thick roof. Finally, early in the morning on April 20th, 1951, they slowly lofted the Mark V atomic device up towards the top of the tower, where at 5.30 in the morning, they finally detonated it. From this camera angle, you can actually see a few of the buildings off to the left. Here are some of the effects the blast had on the buildings. The two-story brick home initially lights on fire from the heat of the blast, but when the shockwave reached the house, it puts out the fire and blows off the roof. Remember, this is a brick home, not a wood home. If we're gonna talk about tornado damage, it's probably in the EF2, maybe EF3 range, the steel industrial warehouse swayed back and forth. Other smaller steel buildings completely collapsed, but the cylindrical shelters held up quite nicely to the blast. They were a little charred, but still standing. Unfortunately, I couldn't find much data on the naval concrete superstructure next to Ground Zero. When looking at the report, this kind of looks like the building, but it also kind of doesn't look like the building. The photocopied photos look terrible, but whatever this is, it definitely took some heavy damage. I even tried to slow down the footage to see if you can make out the building getting smacked by the atomic bomb fireball. But no, you can't. Program 3 of Operation Greenhouse was extremely thorough. Everything was very organized. The surveyors following the blast put together very detailed reports on their findings. This data would presumably be used in future military constructions. What they need to do is build these buildings out of the same materials as these cameras recording the footage. Dang, they barely even shake. The next important nuclear test on everyday structures came two years later during Operation Upshot Knot Hole. Operation Upshot Knot Hole took place at the Nevada test site, and it was a pretty big operation. They shot an atomic bomb out of a cannon during the gravel test. The test Harry was very radioactive and may have caused increased cancer rates to the film crew of the Conqueror who were downwind of the explosion in St. George, Utah. But the test we want to focus on is the very first test of the series, Shaw Annie. Shaw Annie occurred at Area 3 of the Nevada test site, approximately here on Google Earth. There was a lot going on with this test. The media was there as this was the first nationally televised atomic bomb test. Military personnel were conducting various atomic bomb related exercises, and for the first time ever, the Civil Defense Administration was involved with their own operation, what they called Operation Doorstep. Like I said in the intro, the Civil Defense Administration's job was to protect Americans during a nuclear strike, hence the name Civil Defense. Obviously an important aspect of protecting Americans from the bomb involves finding the best locations to seek shelter when sirens go off. And this, by the way, is still pretty valuable information. I mean, you never know. To really find out the best shelter locations, the Civil Defense Administration built two identical two-story homes. One home was 3,500 feet away from ground zero, while the other was 7,500 feet away from ground zero. They also constructed several manufactured underground concrete shelters at various distances from the blast, the closest one being 450 meters away. To further enhance their results, the Civil Defense Administration brought in several mannequins and scattered them in different spots throughout each home. Both homes had a family chilling in the living rooms and dining rooms. They had children playing in the corner. The children mannequins, I don't know, it, they just make the whole thing a bit darker. They even had like a sick kid mannequin up in bed upstairs. Poor guy. In terms of mannequins seeking shelter, in the closest home, a mannequin and her baby were located in a makeshift slanted nook shelter, and in the home furthest away from Ground Zero, there was a family hanging out in a fully constructed basement fallout shelter. This family would be me. Just saying. I got plans to build one. They, they even have a guide on YouTube. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you were planning on constructing a bomb shelter, you should watch this video. In addition to the homes and mannequins, the Civil Defense Administration also placed cars at varying distances from Ground Zero. Finally, at the top of this tower, Annie was detonated early in the morning on March 17th with a yield of 17 kilotons. Here is the effect on house number one. Yeah, 
Um, one could say it was completely destroyed. This is definitely like EF4 damage if we're talking tornadoes. Some aspects of this test are very similar to the previous test with Operation Greenhouse Shot Easy. The house is initially engulfed in flames before the blast wave wipes out the fire. The second house did fare a bit better. It remained standing after the blast wave, but it was still significantly damaged with broken windows and siding. The inside of the house really got messed up. The mannequins chilling in the second house definitely got thrown around. I think in a real life scenario, the humans in the second house would have survived, but they definitely would be uh, pretty beat up, maybe a few broken bones. The mannequins in the basement shelter, however, they were great. They barely even moved. You want to be this family during a nuclear attack and also during a tornado. Going back to the first house that got completely destroyed, the mannequins on the first two levels obviously got wrecked. Here's a photo of a mannequin amongst the destruction. But surprisingly, the mannequin in the basement taking shelter beneath that little slanted wall thingy, she was actually all right. She would have probably survived. Remember, she was only 3,500 feet away from a 16 kiloton atomic explosion. That's impressive. In their report, the Civil Defense Administration recommended that US families, at a minimum, should build a basement shelter. But their best option would still be to build a backyard bunker, as all of those held up best to the blast. I have no idea how to build one of those, so good luck. I think there's like a YouTuber with a dope underground shelter, you know what I'm talking, if you've seen him, it's pretty sweet. Also, it's worth knowing that these homes were treated with a special flame resistant material so that the CDA could focus more on the blast wave effects rather than like a fire. So an actual house would have likely been on fire during the attack. Even the house at 7,500 feet away would have caught fire. That means that while the lady mannequin in the first house would have survived the initial blast, she would have had to escape a pretty insane inferno. Since they didn't incorporate fire-related damage during Operation Doorstep, the Civil Defense Administration used the 37 kiloton Encore test of Upshot Not Hold to test out the flame resistance of three different tiny houses. Two of the houses were considered bad condition. They needed paint. The insides were cluttered with newspapers and magazines scattered about. The house in the middle, however, was the well-kept clean house. During the explosion, the two houses on the sides caught fire while the house in the middle was spared. The Civil Defense Administration released a video called The House in the Middle, which encouraged Americans to be tidy and put together, to be the house in the middle, or else their house may catch fire during a nuclear attack. I don't know, I'm a little bit skeptical of this test, like the house isn't even that disorganized. Just be sure to clean your house quick if the sirens start blaring. The Encore test also destroyed 150 ponderosa pine trees. They brought these in because, you know, ponderosa pine trees, they don't grow in the desert. They brought them in from some nearby canyon and they cemented them into the ground to see them sway. Pretty sick. While Operation Greenhouse and Operation Doorstep were useful in studying a nuclear bomb's effect on various structures, the true test was yet to come. The test where we would actually build a tiny town. That test would come two years later with Operation Teapot during the Apple II shot at the Nevada test site in Area 1. This was the flagship test, if you will, of the Civil Defense Administration, what they called Operation Q. With Operation Q, the Civil Defense Administration wasn't just setting up a couple of houses. No, no, no. They're literally going to build a tiny town with a working infrastructure. This town included different houses with different designs. There were five different houses tested during Operation Q. A single-story ranch house made out of wood on a concrete slab. Two very well-constructed brick homes with reinforced steel, a concrete block house with reinforced steel, yet another ranch house but this time it was built with casted concrete, and finally a wood house similar to those tested two years prior during Operation Doorstep, but this time they made a few improvements. There were also two different power stations with electrical poles. One power station was close to ground zero while another was further away. You had natural gas and propane tanks, there were two radio towers, one with wires, one without. They stocked cabinets and fridges full of food, and of course, the mannequins were back. They were set up in various locations, just like Operation Doorstep. They also placed a line of mannequins outside facing the blast to test out different fabrics slash clothing provided by JCPenney's. Some of the test site workers, by the way, would secretly position mom and dad mannequins in compromising positions in bedrooms when the bosses weren't looking, which is just... That's pretty hilarious. With the town set up, the 29 kiloton Apple II device was detonated on May 5th, 1955. This specific footage right here is some of the most insane footage I've ever seen of anything. Like it's, this is crazy. Here's the first ranch style house. Yeah, definitely some damage there, EF3 if you ask me. But this specific ranch house had a special concrete bathroom shelter on the main floor, and the mannequin in said bathroom shelter 
made it out alive. So if you live in the south where there are no basements, you might want to invest in one of these bathroom shelters. The second two-story brick house that was not reinforced clearly took heavy damage. Here's the house after the test, and yeah, you wouldn't want to be in there. But the concrete houses, they held up pretty well. I mean, the windows were obviously blown out, but you know, they, they stood strong. The improved two-story wood house still had major damage, but we can all agree that it turned out better than this. Now let's take a look at some of the interior camera shots during the test. Holy cow, some of these shots are insane. I think that mannequin lost her wig there. The guide wire tower was still standing while the freestanding tower collapsed. The power station was fine after the explosion. They tested the power station, like all the lines and everything, and it worked great. The propane tanks were also in working condition. Many of the power line poles collapsed, but they were still transmitting power, and according to the surveyors, they could have quickly been fixed. The mannequin standing in a line facing the blast wave had textile designs tattooed onto their skin. The dark patterns etched their marks through the different layers. White clothing, as one might expect, held up much better than darker clothing, so be sure to put on white clothing if the sirens go off. Following the test, JCPenney's actually displayed the mannequins at a store in Las Vegas, so that the general public could inspect the damage themselves. They even took out an ad showing before and after pictures. You might be wondering, where are the mannequins now? Well, no one knows. Seriously, like, there's no documentation of what happened to the mannequins. They could just be in a basement somewhere. The mannequins that are displayed at different atomic bomb museums are replicas. They're not the real ones. If anyone knows the whereabouts of these mannequins, please let me know, because I kind of want to, you know, put one in the background or something. The Civil Defense Administration did learn a lot from Operation Q, and they were able to use the knowledge they gained to improve civil defense planning in the future. In terms of remnants from the test, there are two houses still standing today, and you can actually visit them on the Nevada National Security Site tour. Operation Q also plays an important role in pop culture being referenced in Call of Duty and Indiana Jones. The Indiana Jones special effects are insane, by the way. I feel like it's a pretty accurate portrayal, so good job to the special effects team. Also, just as a side note, I don't think a fridge would be a great place to take shelter. Well, there you have it. That was a brief history of nuclear testing on everyday civilian buildings and situations. However, there is one important factor to consider when looking at the results from all the tests discussed in today's video. All these devices were very small when compared to thermonuclear bombs. They were in the 15 to 40 kiloton range, while in reality, if World War III happens, the bombs would likely be in the megaton range. The Civil Defense Administration themselves acknowledged this and stated that these results from Operation Q would be equivalent to being 9 miles away from a 20 megaton bomb. That's pretty far away. You know, people laugh at the duck and cover video because they assume that being in an atomic bomb, they would instantly vaporize. And when we're talking about thermonuclear bombs, that may be true, but these tests show that taking shelter inside buildings actually can sometimes make a huge difference, even ducking underneath a desk. But hopefully, we don't have to worry about any of this. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to seek shelter in an interior room on the lowest floor or get in a backyard bunker if you have one of those, or maybe just find your local fallout shelter. I actually have all mine mapped out in my little area, like I, I seriously do, just in case, you never know. And with that said, we'll see you next time.